Hi, I'm Eric Weir, and welcome to another episode of Stuttering Your Way to Success. I'm, I'm here today with a friend of mine, Police Chief Keith Groundsell, who's the police chief in Lawrence County. He's before that, he was in Simpsonville. But more than that, he, he's written four books. He has an up, upcoming TV show coming out, right? Yes, and, sir. And you've done work around the world, including Afghanistan. I'm so excited to have you on today. What got you into police work? You know, I, I grew up in a household of, of public servants. My father was a United States Marine for 22 years, mm -hmm. and uh, it was kind of instilled in me at a young age. I knew I didn't want to sit behind a desk or do anything like that. And, right. and I joke about that now because I'm a chief now when I do sit behind right, a desk. Right, right, but I, I, didn't want, I didn't yeah. want the job to be the same thing every single day, right. monotony, working in a factory or anything like right. that. And uh, the opportunity came to be a police officer after college, and, and I took advantage of that in my hometown at the time, Malden, South Carolina. And uh, just hit it out of the park from there. It's been a wonderful career the last 25 years. Wow. And you have a you have a TV show, Undercover Caught on Tape. T tell me about that. What's yeah, the concept so there? It's, it's quite interesting. You know, there's not really a lot of shows out there about true, deep undercover people. I'd say less than 1% of all law enforcement actually were deep undercover. Okay. There's a misconception out there that plainclothes officers mm -hmm. are undercover. Okay. And they're not. They may be doing an undercover surveillance assignment sure. or something like that. But deep undercover, where you're full-time undercover, is very rare. So I, I published a series of books called uh, A Narc's Tale. Uh, a producer mm -hmm. read my books, contacted me. We did a, a short film or mm -hmm. a short filming session. Mm -hmm. And uh, A&E picked up the series. Mm -hmm. And uh, I filmed a couple episodes with that. And it's going to showcase undercovers from all across the United States. It actually used real footage. It's not reenactments. Wow. And it shows everything. And then it talks to the undercovers after about the mental effects. It maybe even talks to the suspects or the informants that may mm -hmm. have been involved or family members. It's a pretty neat concept. How does being undercover? I mean, what's that like? Uh, is it fulfilling, and how, how does it, how does it impact you as a person? Yeah, it's um, it was very exciting, but the problem was if you've ever done anything really exciting, what do you want to do? You want to talk about it. Right. You want to tell people, but you can't. Right. So right. it's like doing the most exciting thing in your life and having this major adrenaline dump every single right. day. Right, right. But you can't tell anybody your story. And that's what got me into writing. That was kind of my therapy. Oh, interesting. And okay. uh, I wanted to okay. write the stories right. down to one day be able to tell the story to my children. That was right. that was where it started. It wasn't right. about right. putting it out there to the masses, but I wanted them to know why I was gone for months at a time, sometimes didn't even come home. Wow. No, uh, when I was reading about you, one of the things I noticed is that when you became the police chief of Simpsonville, it was the twenty eighth, I think, safest county or city, yeah. whatever in the in the state, and you you moved in two years to first. So, how do you make so much change? You know, for me, I think my narcotics background helped mm -hmm. me because narcs are proactive. It's not like a property crimes investigator. You get a report from a burglary or a theft, and you investigated after the fact, you don't have to be proactive in that aspect. Mm. In law enforcement, as a narcotics investigator, you have to go out there, develop informants, be proactive, run surveillance. I think that ingrained in me mm -hmm. a policing concept mm -hmm. of being very proactive. Mm -hmm. I also realized that 95% of all crime is linked to drugs in some way, shape, mm -hmm. or form, whether it be oh, domestic right? violence, okay. utilizing alcohol, mm -hmm. or some sort of a theft to support a drug habit, mm -hmm. or a burglary mm -hmm. for a theft to support drug habits, or an assault for a rival drug dealer or a drug deal gone bad. So I realized if you go after drug traffickers hardcore and you partner with uh, mental health people, mm -hmm. you partner with people in rehab for true addicts that actually mm -hmm. need it, and then you do community policing, mm -hmm. you can change the, the structure, the dynamics of oh, any wow. police department, any city. Mm -hmm. And we went from number 28 safest city in the state of South Carolina to number one in two years. And, and it remarkable. was a, a testament to true community policing wow. and going after drug wow. traffickers. How do border issues, I mean, the U.S. border between Mexico or between Canada and the ease of access or getting yeah. across, I mean, I mean, what do you see as the impact yeah. of that on drugs? It, it, and it's a huge impact. The U.S. You know, in general. There's basic uh, business principles of supply and demand. Right. You know, we have a huge demand for drugs in the United States, mm -hmm. and Mexico is a huge supply nation, and not only for right. the United States, but also for the world. Right. And if we allow that border to be open and allow the drugs to come across, they come across at a, a much more inexpensive cost. Um, they're more readily available mm -hmm. to just about anybody. But the problem is it's not just coming from Mexico, just drugs. 
It's terrorist networks, narco terrorists. Wow. It's other criminal elements that are coming into the United States, and we really don't know what we have. Hmm. We don't know what they're planning, what they're plotting, and mm -hmm. it's rather scary from a law enforcement perspective because narcotics are one thing. Mm -hmm. Killed over 110,000 people last year in the opioid epidemic. Jeez, that's like, that's what? almost greater than any war right. we've been in, you know, the right. last 50 years or, or wow, more. That's remarkable. And, and people don't look at that. That's on an annual basis. And where wow. are those drugs coming from? Some of it from China, some of it through the Mexico border predominantly. Mm -hmm. What are we doing about that? We have to shut down a lot down the border. It's just like your house. You have a, a lock on your front door and you have a door. For right. a reason, you have a fence to protect what's inside. Right. You don't have it to be evil or mean. Yeah. We just have to know who's coming here. We need to have a, a, a process by which people can get here legally as well. Of course. You know, that's yeah. much quicker than it is currently. Wow, wow, wow. So uh, on our show, Studioway Success, we, we, like, we basically say there, you know, no one I've had on has had success without a setback. Absolutely. Uh, are, are there any setbacks you, you can share with us? And <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you've had them, I mean, how do they shape you and what yeah. did you learn? So one thing for me is constant setbacks in, right. in leadership. Because when you're striving to do something that most people around you can't do, <laughs> aren't willing to do, you're going to have haters. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have people that go in opposition of you wow. just because they don't want to see you succeed. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's it's been a lot of personal growth. But mm -hmm. one of the most important things through all those experiences, mm -hmm. don't become jaded. You know, just because you have one or two bad people that go against what you're trying to do with the intentions of helping society as a whole, don't become jaded to the point where you don't trust anybody and think everybody's bad. Because that's, mm. that's not the reality. But for right. me, you know, I've, ha I've had many of struggles. Um, um, I remember some of my first early struggles when I was in Afghanistan. Uh, I quickly worked my way up and I was over, I had 144 Americans uh, U.S. Department of State contractors that worked for me, and we had a 5,000-man SWAT team that we had to develop Gee, in that nation. And, and I remember sitting in the cafeteria one day. I had just sent out assignments for another program they asked me to run called FDD, Focus District Development. Basically, Afghanistan's landlocked. So they took a compass and put a road around Afghanistan for trade called Ring Road, <clears throat> and they wanted us to go in and basically take out the Taliban and build police departments from the ground up while I was going to deploy all of my men that worked for me into very hostile areas. Mm. And it didn't, the orders that I had to push down, mm -hmm. I knew there could be uh, drastic consequences to that, oh, life wow. impacting. And uh, a lot of people didn't expect that type of a deployment on a police mission that they were doing, and uh, I had a lot of opposition from it. And I remember oh, I sitting in a cafeteria, I had let all my men eat. And I was getting what was left. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, uh, General Kavanaugh, mm -hmm. who was uh, vice president of operations for DynCorp International at the mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. he came in there. He looked at me and said, it's lonely at the top, isn't it, son? <laughs> and uh, I, I really that really ingrained in me. He sat down and, and we had a conversation. And his wisdom was, was unbelievable. And he let me know, you know, there's a lot of storms you're going to weather in your career, but stay the course. Yeah. You know, and, and always much. have good intentions. If you mm -hmm. have good intentions, mm -hmm. people will see that, the majority. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have bad people that aren't going to like the orders that came down, and they're going to do everything in their power to shun the focus off of them sure. to get out of it. So, do, 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 do you have a process you go through or, or routine to, 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 to set goals and objectives? Absolutely. And, 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 and in addition to that, do you, do you have something that you do on a, on a daily basis? And if so, yeah. could, could you tell us? You know, that? I have quite a few things. So right. every single day I wake up, I make my bed. Okay. Uh, that's number one win. Uh, then <laughs> uh, then, yeah. then I, I drink coffee and watch the news. Okay. And, and I want to know current events, what's okay. going on in the world. Right. And then I work out. Okay. Every single day. I'm actually on day 87 in a row where I haven't missed a day at working out. Not, I normally don't go seven days a week, but I have this thing in my brain. My goal is 100 <laughs> oh, days in a row. There, yeah. and then I'm going to go to 365. Yeah. It's, it's going to oh, continue wow, forever because wow. I don't want to erase the little marks. You're going straight there? You're going to take a break so, and start over? No break. I want to continue to go. Right? If I take yeah, a break, yeah. i got to erase all the That's hash marks thinking, yeah. on my mirror yeah. Yeah. in the morning. <laughs> yeah. You're going to recognize yourself in the I morning. I do. Yeah. I have all my goals <laughs> written on my mirror. Okay. And I have personal goals and I have work goals. Ah, okay. And every morning when I work out, my fiance 
Jose and I work out together every single morning, yeah. uh, five thirty in the morning, right. and it's just a routine that we do. And if I don't do it, I absolutely right. feel terrible. It's, I believe you know God gives you one vessel. Right. And that's your body. Right. And, and a healthy mind, body, and soul yeah. are the key to success oh, in yeah. whatever you choose yeah. Yeah. to be successful in. But a life without goals is like going to the range and shooting just into a hill right. and saying you're the greatest shot on planet Earth, but you don't have a target that you're aiming for, right. and you can't see how accurate you are as a right. shooter. That's and that's what it's like. And, and yeah. I, I expect my staff and everybody to set goals, and then we set goals as a department together. Nice, nice. How would you define, uh, similar to ask you, how would you define success? What would you say? I think that's to the individual. You yeah. know, for me personally, um, I don't try and compare myself to anybody. I kind of want to be my own man, a trailblazer, I, mm -hmm. I like to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, success for me is probably leaving a legacy that my children are proud of. Okay. Um, that That's something. And when I get to those pearly gates one day, God's going to say, you did it right, son. And, and ultimately, that's what it's about. It's mm -hmm. This time on earth is very short right. in the blip of eternity, and right. we're trying to get into heaven. And, and what we do with this little bit of time here, that's why I, I personally love being in public service. Right. Um, I could choose another career. I've, I've been successful in the construction business. I've done other jobs where I could make a ton of money. Mm -hmm. But for me, I didn't have that mm -hmm. self-fulfillment mm -hmm. that I seek in life. And, and I'm a, a life's experience type of guy. And that's probably gotcha. why I've spent a lot of time overseas, six years. Yeah. Then I spent six years deep undercover and then been all over the place. Wow, wow, wow. Um, if you could go back and, and t talk to your 20-year-old your, 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 your self, your, your, your less <laughs> mature self, maybe your more uh, idealistic self, Yeah. W what would you say? I would say slow down and enjoy the small wins along the way. Mm -hmm. I, I'm never uh, happy with the small wins because I only see the great goal that's far off. Mm -hmm. And slowing down and, and uh, appreciating you know, these small wins and enjoying them with the people that helped you get there, mm -hmm. I think is crucial. A, a happy work-life balance is not something I'm the best at, mm -hmm. and I acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I've asked like people on my, my staff, like my command staff, my executive command staff, to hold me accountable to that. You know, mm -hmm. you know tell me, go home. Mm -hmm. You know, I always prided myself in outworking everybody, and, mm -hmm. and that was something that I felt like, I never ask anybody to do something that I, I'm not willing to do myself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. by no means am I even close to being perfect as a leader, but right. I self-reflect quite a bit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I try and learn from every single failure and every single experience that I go through. Mm. What was it like when you were working internationally, particularly in, in Afghanistan? Yeah. Afghanistan was, you know, I didn't quite understand um, the culture you know, mm -hmm. that much going into it. Right. Uh, I quickly uh, learned that the small things, uh, you know, do add up. For example, we had built a base and uh, we put new toilets in and, and everything, showers, running water. Well, we recruited police officers after we went in with the military and basically annihilated the Taliban and then recruited what was left right. to become police officers. Yeah. Well, we brought them in and uh, these people had never seen a shower, mm -hmm. never had running water, never seen a toilet. You know, the first week, <laughs> the first week in our brand new bathrooms and police academy, all the toilets clogged up and, and the plumbers came in and we were like, what's going on? They were compacted the pipes with river rocks and, no and they didn't know how to use a toilet. So we had to change the oh, curriculum to a whole week man. of personal hygiene because they were standing up on the toilets mm -hmm. and uh, didn't know how to sit down on a toilet. Just the basic Just stuff. The basic and then stuff, I'm supposed yeah. to take this population right. that 10% can read and write no and way. create a special forces unit. <laughs> <laughs> so it was rather difficult at times, but uh, we found some great successes. Yeah. And uh, I felt comfortable Towards the end there, I was injured over there and, and came back and had some surgeries. And uh, it's oh, wow. really sad what happened in Afghanistan. The, the mm -hmm. I call it a retreat, not a withdrawal. Right. Um, what happened there, you, we pretty much annihilated the Taliban, right. our, our U.S. military forces there, and combined with joint securities mm -hmm. from other countries. But uh, we just left them $90 billion in, in weapons. All of a sudden, overnight, the Taliban, when I was there, the Taliban was like a street gang, mm -hmm. like the Bloods and the Crips, mm -hmm. and Al-Qaeda were the masterminds. Right. Now, all of a sudden, the Taliban is the largest, one of the largest you know, terrorist networks in the world with an Air Force and an Army. 
and wow. weaponry that we would have never seen from a terrorist network. No. Like and that was created by pulling out too quickly. You, there, there's a, a time and a place to withdraw, but once you have a footprint there, we have Bagram Airfield, Jalalabad Airfield, Kandahar Airfield, all the big airfields. You maintain those. We've never pulled out of Vietnam. We've never pulled out of Korea. We've never pulled out of any war right. like that. Right. You leave a footprint right. to ensure the safety right. of the countries around there. Your mm. promise to the Afghans mm -hmm. and your promise to the nation that we mm. will not allow that to become the world network for the Taliban to prosper terrorism. 95% of the entire world got their opium from Afghanistan when the U.S. first went in there. So that was funding al-Qaeda. So one of the programs that I was also working in was a poppy eradication program. Oh my I was word. a former special agent with DEA. I resigned from them and became a contract with the U.S. Department of State. So they saw my background, and that was one of the programs that I was also assisting and helping out with. Mm -hmm. And that was just eye-opening in and of itself, trying to find an alternate crop for local farmers oh, that wow. paid the same amount of money. There really wasn't one. And then <laughs> during the day, they'll cooperate with us. But at nighttime, when the Taliban comes around, they cooperate with the Taliban. So we had police officers that were recruited and vetted, and they were police during the day, Taliban at night. Police during the day, Taliban at night. It became a business thing where the Taliban would say, hey, we'll pay you $100 a month, and the U.S. was paying $85 a month. That was how it was worked. I mean, it was, it was quite interesting no to see the dynamics, and, and you had to do everything through tribal elders and different tribes. And... and that helped me a lot to learn to negotiate, you know, and slow down a little bit. Later on, I, I went to Liberia, West Africa. I was a senior yeah, advisor what was that like? there to the inspector general. And uh, they had just survived Ebola, and they had just survived prior to that a civil war that was brutal, brutal with cannibalism and all sorts of child soldiers oh, wow. and things like that. And uh, it was a very interesting dynamic. There were 16 tribes that made up that country. And I remember I was playing on the uh, – the police national soccer team, mm -hmm. and they were going to play against different tribes. And I got invited by one of the tribes to play. And uh, I reported it up my chain of command, mm -hmm. up, you know, to the ambassador and things like that. And they was like, be very cautious. You know, you probably shouldn't play for one tribe because the other tribes, other 15 will probably hate you. You know, so it was like, okay, this is pretty eye-opening. And um, so for me, I played with the, the police national team. We actually went to the, the national championship there okay. and lost in overtime. No on way. That one. Yeah, it was quite fun. I'm 40-something years old, and I'm still playing soccer, and uh, and and I enjoyed it. I, I learned at a young age soccer was my sport, and I didn't yeah. realize – how much of an international invitation oh, that, that would bring me. Yeah, yeah. When I worked in Haiti for two years, I was a United States contingent commander to the United Nations okay. on a Department of State contract. When I played soccer, I instantly became popular and like a celebrity yeah. amongst the Brazilians and the different groups sure, that were there. Sure, so sure. it was like all this time growing up playing soccer really benefited me <laughs> internationally. <laughs> and in America, it didn't do a whole lot for me initially other yeah. than, you know, getting a scholarship to play yeah. soccer in college. It paid your way through college, right? Exactly. And I'm not complaining about <laughs> that at all. That still yeah. paying dividends, right? No wow. doubt. So what position do you, do, do you play? So I played up front, and uh, in high school, I, I probably peaked in high school. I, I would have to say, unfortunately, you know, I was injured in college. I, I led the entire state of South Carolina in goals scored. Oh, wow. And uh, I, I had 110 goals I scored in high school. 50-something <laughs> my senior year. That and, seems uh, like a lot when it's one at a time. Yeah, right? Well, yeah, it was a lot, no <laughs> doubt. And uh, so I went off to college, and I quickly – I got injured pretty early on in my right. career. Right. But that taught me some valuable lessons. You know, I, I thought I was going to be a professional soccer player. Right. And sure. all of a sudden, my grades went from C's to straight A's. And I concentrated on, on academics, realizing, what's your backup plan? So when I talk to my kids now about their goals – I say, what's your backup plan? Right. Because I explain, especially when it's sports goals. Right. These these young people nowadays, they want to be in the NBA and right. the NFL. They don't realize yeah. the probability yeah. is pretty slim and none. Oh, real small. Yeah. yeah. But what is your backup plan? Ha right. Have something right. there for you that's that's right. a fallback where you don't feel like a failure. Wow. How did fatherhood change you? Who I, I was working deep undercover. I had been undercover for about three years straight. Mm -hmm. Um, the day my son was born, I actually was fighting some guys in the parking lot. <laughs> oh, my geez. wife was in labor at the time for 26 hours. She was trying to oh. have the baby oh. natural, my son, Caleb. And, uh, and I, she said, can you get me something to eat? I mean, it was to that point, 26 <laughs> oh, wow. hours. It's like, I got to eat. I'm hungry now. So I said, all right, I'm going to run across to the McDonald's real quick. And I came back and I see some guys, 
uh, jumping out of a car, cutting the toolboxes off the backs of cars. <laughs> they had like eight toolboxes. And, and, and my like uh, skill set on the side as a hobby is, you know, woodwork. And I realized a craftsman without his tools is, is helpless, you know. Right. So if you steal a guy's tools, he, he can't work and he can't right. bring home food. So it bothered me. So I sat in the car. I dialed 911. I said, you know, this investigator grounds so with the uh, Greenville County Sheriff's Office. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm undercover guy. I don't look like a cop. I'm in plain clothes. I had a ponytail, yeah. a beard. Right. And I was like, can you send an officer out here? These guys are stealing toolbox. I'm not going to intervene unless I have to. Sure enough, they spotted me, you know, after some time. And when they did, they took off. Well, I'm in my wife's car. So I follow them. And they went down an area where I knew it was a dead end. Right. They didn't know it was a dead end. Right. So when they pulled down and had to slam on brakes, I came in behind them and slid sideways like this. They threw it in reverse and punched it and started coming at me. So I bailed out of the car thinking they're going to total my wife's car at the time. Jeez. I jumped out and I pull out my 38 and I'm trying to grab the guy through the window where I couldn't get my credentials out. So I didn't have a badge out. I got long hair. <laughs> I got a pistol in my hand. I'm trying to yank a guy out through the window. Yeah. Well, the first cops come over the hill and thank the good Lord it was one of my old roommates. It was right. a Greenville City Police officer. Right. Right. And he recognized me, and I backed off really quick. Right. And I'm up there. I go back up there as fast as I can, and they're coming in there getting statements from me while my wife's in labor. <laughs> so so it, it, that was a, the, the, fir, the birth of my first child, bringing right. them into that world kind of <laughs> a little bit crazy. But it changed me from the perspective of <laughs> I started to uh, think beyond myself. Right. You know, I, I live for myself. I truly believed I was going to die before I was 30. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I had that belief, so I wanted to go out in a blaze of glory in a gunfight. That mm -hmm. was kind right. of the weird way I right. lived, right. so I lived fearless. And it caused me not to live as fearless. So mm -hmm. I, I often say that if my children were older while I was working undercover, I may not have lived through the things I lived through because mm -hmm. I may have had those hesitations thinking about maybe I shouldn't do this because of my kids. Mm -hmm. uh, the one good thing uh, about my ex-wife now, she's my ex, but at the time she was very respectful mm -hmm. in, in the manner of, you know, don't bring those personal problems at home to work mm -hmm. with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was able to concentrate on my work because I feel like if you mentally are checked out mm -hmm. and you're going deep undercover into an infiltrated gang and you're mm -hmm. by yourself, mm -hmm. Anything that mentally throws you off and, and you hesitate mm -hmm. for a slight second instead of just react mm -hmm. out of street smarts and things sure. like that <clears throat> can cost you your life. Wow. Wow. If, 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 you're, if, if someone's listening to our show today and they're saying, hey, I have a, a, an interest in, in a career in, 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 the, in law enforcement, what sort of advice would you give them? You have to learn that it's all about caring for people. You know, 95% of police work is not what you see on TV. 95% is helping people, problem solving. One of the things I hate to see the most with law enforcement officers is when I hear them say, uh, sir, ma'am, that's a civil matter. We can't help you. Mm. Bull crap. Mm -hmm. You can help do problem solving and conflict resolution with anybody at any time. Was oh, that right? Okay. If you do not want to do it, it may escalate into a criminal matter. Because it's something, a neighborly dispute over property or right. somebody's dog pooping in somebody's yard right. or something. To them, that's a big issue. Right. It's a disrespect issue. Why not try and problem solve it? Right. I mean, when, when officers don't want to engage like that, I feel like sometimes those are the officers that really may be in a long, wrong line of work. If, if you're in it just for the action, that's not, that's not what it's about. Sure. You know, now, you will see craziness throughout right. your career, and, right. and you'll encounter <laughs> hundreds of critical incidents, and the average human being only encounters maybe three in a lifetime, and you'll right. encounter hundreds. Oh, and, interesting. Uh, yeah, I guess yeah that's so, true. I mean, yeah. it's, it's uh, PTSD is a real thing amongst right. law enforcement yeah. officers, and, and we're doing a better job at getting peer support out there, mm. and we just got our first therapy dog at, at uh, Lawrence Police Department. Still in training. Her name's Delilah. She's a six-month-old mm. golden mm. retriever. And uh, we have a peer support team. Mm. We, we do different things. We have uh, therapy horses that we, we partnered up with these mini horses, tiny trotters, mm -hmm. that also do a, like a Just Say Woe to Bullying program as right. well. It's, right. it's the extra little things that you right. got to do to cater to the community. And you're a public servant. Mm. And you're not just a, a hardcore guy that goes out and enforces the law. That's not what law enforcement is today. Okay. Okay, great. So, so years ago, I, I remember my, my sons had an interest in going yeah. to Simpsonville, and you, you had like a junior, I forget the name, like a cadet or, or something yeah. like that, where they could get a feel for being a police yeah, officer. Yeah, like a junior 
police academy cadet program correct, correct, and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you still do that, or are, 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 so, are you seeing the, how, how that impacts people? Or it, we're not doing it currently. That's mm-hmm. I, I just started just over a year ago mm-hmm. in my new position at the Lawrence mm-hmm. Police Department. That's something that I anticipate mm-hmm. doing. Um, I'm blessed in my current position where I have school resource officers in every school, elementary mm-hmm. all the way up. A lot of agencies don't have that. They just mm-hmm. have like middle school and mm-hmm. high school. So, yes, I anticipate doing that again like we did in Simpsonville. It gave them an opportunity to get a true understanding mm-hmm. of what law enforcement work is all about. And that helps them when they go off to college if they have ambitions to be a law enforcement officer. Mm-hmm. Those will either be solidified mm-hmm. or it will determine maybe this eh, is not mm-hmm. necessarily what mm-hmm. I wanted to do. The criminal justice field is vast. Right. I mean, there are so many things you can do. You don't have to be a police officer in a uniform. You can do so many different things. So I try and tell people, you know, I've been blessed. I've worked at the city level, county, state, federal, international. I've worked at every level of law enforcement. I don't know it all. There's so much I've never done still. But I can give a well-rounded, you know, aspects of my career to somebody and hopefully mentor them in the right direction to allow them to pick the right career, whether it be federal or local, right. or probation, corrections, sure. or police. I understand. It's up to them. So you, 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 you're very interested in, the, in that. You, you, you've, you've traveled internationally. You've been involved with the, with, with the government. You've been, like I said, Haiti, Liberia, Afghanistan. And you've also owned businesses. Yeah. So is there overlap between yeah. police work and, and, and a leading group of people and, yes. and, 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 and business? And what could I, as a business person, you, yeah. you know, l- l- learn from you? So for me, uh, business, uh, one of the one business I used to own was uh, an audiovisual company. Okay. And I didn't know anything about AV. Okay. My partner did. Right. He knew everything about it, but I knew people. Okay. And it was about people. Everything is about people. It's about relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, people want to do business with somebody they trust. Okay. Yep. And if there's no trust there, you know, I, I can be a higher price than the other five, ten estimates that came in. Sure. But they want to do business with me because they feel like I took the time with them or they trust that it's going to get done. Right. You know, and, and I think that's an important aspect of business and any relationship right. in, in law enforcement or the business world. Great, great. So uh, I, I had somebody tell me when I was 12 years old, I said, Eric, uh, and this was super morbid. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, imagine a tombstone and, and think about how you want to be remembered and live your life to be that person, you know. So, so how do you want to be re- re- remembered? Yeah. For me, I just want to get into heaven. Yeah. I mean, truly, I want to be remembered my legacy of, you know, always doing the things that the people around me thought they couldn't do and helping right. them achieve more right. than they've ever thought. I, I look back like my command staff in the last year and three months in my position, we've grown leaps and bounds and accomplished so many great things. But I also pushed them so hard that it, it – there were some casualties, if you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. You know, some people couldn't stick it out and things like that. And then I have to sit here now and I have to self-reflect on, all right, we've gotten to this point. We've gotten rid of some of the problems that this mm-hmm. agency had notoriously mm-hmm. in the past. Mm-hmm. And now we're at a point where I have to just fully entrust the men and women that I'm surrounded with and, and give them the reins and right. let them lead themselves right. and be there for guidance. Right. And that's the phase I'm in. It's like phase two right. of changing a culture. Right. You know, at first you have to come in an element of change and, and it's hard. Mm. You know, you lose, you know, a lot of staff, but for me, we got fully People staffed like very quickly. Yeah. And in law enforcement, when I was chief in Simpsonville, we were 100% fully staffed. Chief in Lawrence, 100% fully staffed. You know, that is very unusual, and I contribute that to a couple of things. I contribute it to the mm-hmm. vision and the leadership, and not just my leadership, mm-hmm. but within the department. And also my city administrator fully supports me. He's phenomenal. My mayor is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. That's not always the case. Right. I, I lived right, right. through that in Simpsonville where yeah. our mayor got indicted and convicted of two or three charges uh, against moral turpitude, and then the head of investigation for 25 years got convicted or pled guilty to a, a cover-up of a rape and a murder from 20 something years prior. So I haven't always had that support when I come in to clean things up and I do now. And it's so wonderful, but I try, like I I said earlier, not to be jaded by past experiences, but sometimes you can't help what you've been through and you sometimes become defensive when you see things. And, but I have to catch myself Mm -hmm. at times like I, 
this is not where I was before. Mm -hmm. These people actually genuinely care, and they're good people. I have a mayor that has no political ambitions beyond being mayor. Mm -hmm. That's important. Mm -hmm. If you have political ambitions beyond the position you're in, sometimes that's scary. Not all the time, right? But sometimes that, that can be scary. You're a stepping yeah. stone, and they're going to do anything yeah. not to ruffle feathers, right? Not do what's right every single time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I look for. And when I when I interviewed for this last job, I had 12 hours of interviews. One day was a six-hour interview, and I felt like it was this right here. Me and you having a conversation. Right. And I had nothing to lose. I had just signed a contract. I had a five-year contract. I was just named national project manager for the nation of Nigeria. We were building up a police force to fight Boko Haram and ISIS. And I had just leased massive buildings and done all these things. And then all of a sudden, I took a $100,000 pay cut to become a police chief locally because I have three teenagers at home right. and a six-year-old. Wow. You know, I, I didn't want to be gone. I just deployed for four years. Mm -hmm. I, I was ready to be home. And um, I don't have a full retirement because I went international. I went federal with the Drug Enforcement Administration, mm -hmm. and then I worked locally. Mm -hmm. So I spread out, and right. most of the guys, I'm at 25 years. I should be retiring right, right now. Right, right, like right. most guys, right. I've still got 15 more years at least. Right. And I feel healthy, and I feel like now yeah. – I'm much wiser. I still right. make mistakes, and I'm right. still learning every day. But I feel I have more to give right. to help others. And, right. and that's what I look forward to the most. That's fantastic. Well, thanks for coming. I won't want to say, but I appreciate you coming on today. And Thank you. I've got your book here. Let me, awesome. we'll, we'll cut and edit this. Thank you. Let me show you the book we have. Yeah, absolutely. Stills, but, uh, absolutely. We'll have, we'll put it right we'll here. Just talk for another second. Let me sign. You sign it. They'll film you signing it. Cool. Those edit all this up. And then we'll have this. Uh, today, I, today I was on with uh, Police Chief Keith Groundsville. This is his book, A Narc's Tale, Volume One of Four. Would, would you sign a copy for me? Absolutely. Thank you. It'd be my pleasure. Then I got to get yours. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it works. That's right. I've, I've, I've written one book, so I can't imagine writing four. I just finished another, a children's book, Stop. actually. Yeah. <laughs> I actually have, I saw, I, You're writing full, man. <laughs> my kids don't even know this, time. but I start, I, yeah. I did a children's book, and it's yeah. just about valuable lessons, yeah. you know, for, for kids from saying no to drugs, saying no yeah. to bullying, right. chivalry, uh, things that are dying out in yeah. our, our modern day society. Yeah. Don't cheat. How to treat people with respect, cyber, you know, crimes, yeah. and, and don't send pictures of yourself or anything like that. That's right. that's going to be permanently out right. there on the internet. Right. So I, I hadn't even fully named it. I named it something after my my son, but the man of wisdom that's speaking in the book is right. my father, Craig. Oh no! And, way. Uh, so okay, great. they don't even know this. So like yeah. I haven't told anybody this. So I'll pro I'm trying to get the illustration part done now and that's that's a different beast for me because right. this book my series has over 350 like real photos and newspaper articles and things like that to authenticate all the stories now this is an illustration and i have to get an artist and do all that oh, so my it's a different realm for me wow. and uh i wanted to write so a, a leadership book down the road for you right. know you know lessons you know from each thing oh, that i've fantastic. experienced in my life yeah. but yeah it's it's fun, you know, writing's become my therapy. Between writing and working out, those are like my two outlets. Okay. I think those are really important. How much do you write? I mean, I mean, say, I'm, I'm a, it's probably hard to every day, right? I can type do, pretty do quick. Take, I can type probably type like 80 words a minute. No really. Way. When I get in the zone, I'm like, really? oh, sometimes wow. I forget, but my fingers are just doing it. Oh, it's, wow. It's going so fast. Yeah, I've but never yeah, had that experience. I wrote, I actually, <laughs> <laughs> I actually wrote the children's book yeah. over, the, over the weekend. Yeah. So I had a bunch of bullet points. That's how yeah. I kind of start out. I'll, okay. I'll put an idea okay. out there and then I'll put bullet points points then i'll emphasize something under each bullet point and then i'll go back and actually tell the story okay. right. and then i'll go back like a children's book you gotta kind of have a flow and it has right. to rhyme right. a little bit right. so then i'm trying to do that now right. and that's been kind of difficult when I, I'm, yeah. I'm a police officer that's you know? what I'm, saying. I'm used yeah. to writing like police reports and right. stuff like right. that right. so it's it's a good experience for me i i I grew up, you know, uh, early on in my life, I was diagnosed with a learning disability okay. and uh, like elementary school. And, really? I, and I never took that as like a bad thing. I took it as I know I have to work twice as hard as the next guy right. to memorize what they can probably memorize in five minutes may take me an hour. Right. But you know what? 
Once you it got created it. work ethic. And once I got it, I yeah. got it. Right. And that was ingrained in me at a young age. And then I saw my dad working three jobs. My dad was a Marine full-time. He was a janitor at night, and he worked another part-time job. Jeez, so when bro. I saw that, he'd be cleaning the hospital at the base at night. And it was just, for me, I, I saw what a great male role model is, right. a, a man of integrity, a man right. that – just worked for his family and was there for his family. And my parents been married 50 something years. And uh, to have that, I'm blessed. Oh, sure. You know what sure. I'm saying? And it, what's sad for me is I went through a divorce, you mm -hmm. know, and, and everybody's like, oh, it had to have been all your undercover years that added stress on your marriage. Yeah, they added stress on my marriage for sure. But what really was the ultimate stressor, I would say, was political. Mm. You know, when I was chief in Simpsonville, mm -hmm. you know, doing the right thing is not easy. You know, when you're up against people who are not the greatest of people, mm -hmm. you know, and they may have gotten indicted and convicted later on. Mm -hmm. But what they did during that time period to shift the blame or the focus off of their negative stuff mm -hmm. was difficult. You know, mm -hmm. the rumors, the lies, all that stuff. And only thing that heals that is time. Right. You have to forgive. Because right. if you live jaded and, and upset all the wow. time, life sucks. You know, so I don't live that way, but it took a long time. You know, yeah. I had to rededicate my life to Christ, get rebaptized, and just truly give it up wow. and let it roll. But don't forget, God doesn't make fools. You right. know, don't forget it, but don't hold grudges. Because right. judgment day for those people is not on earth. Right. You know, and, and I'm not the one who's going to punish them. Right. So I've had to let it, let it slide. Let it go, yeah. How important is, is, is gratitude... And how important is forgiveness in your mind? It, it, it's a personal thing for me. Forgiveness is, is something that you have to you have to have because otherwise you're just going to live life grumpy, think everybody's out to get you, and you'll never advance personally or professionally. Hmm. Um, gratitude is key. Don't ever forget the people that helped you to get where you are, the people that supported you behind the scenes, especially your family. You know, those are the ones they've forgotten about group. Mm -hmm. And if you forget that, you lose focus on, mm -hmm. on, on everything. So me personally, the greater responsibility I have in leadership roles, whether it's leading 5,000, 14,000, or 50, I have a great responsibility for those people. So the bigger the leadership role, the greater the responsibility. For me, I'm blessed because of my father, the way I saw him lead, mm -hmm. Egos don't come into check. Confidence and ego get mistaken a lot of times. Mm. People think you're, you're confident you're, you have a big ego. That's far from the truth. I care so much about what people think about things. I look at perception all the time to the point that it drives my command staff crazy because somebody's perception is their reality. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I try and preach that to them. But, yeah, I, I've definitely learned gratitude and humbleness. Mm. Humbleness is, um, for me, is not just necessarily – internal how I process things humbleness is when I see somebody on my staff achieve great success even if I was involved in that success being more proud for them than I am for myself is true wisdom and humbleness mm -hmm. you know and that comes with many years experience I didn't truly understand people like be humble be humble what, what does that mean you know what I'm saying? And then when I realized it, when I was so proud of my people for accomplishing things, that's what great, humble leaders do. Mm -hmm. They are super proud and grateful for the people around them finding their successes, no matter if you had to struggle to help them get those successes. That's wow. humbleness. I, I could talk to you for hours. Oh, yeah, I could too. <laughs> <laughs> Good to well, see thank you, coming on, bro. Definitely. Absolutely. Thank you Absolutely. so much, man. Yeah. And thanks for joining me today with another episode of Stuttering Your Way to Success. My, my uh, guest today was Police Chief Keith Groundsell. Check out his book. It's called A Narc's Tale. There's, there are four of these books. I've read the first one. Fantastic reading, and great having you today. Thank you again. Thank Appreciate you. it. Yep.